God, the Lord, you are one. Yes. Blessed is your name, the glorious name, the glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you and I shall love and deny our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength. And these words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart and you're to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them as they sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up bind them as a sign on your hand and they have to be a frontlet between your eyes and write them on the doorposts on your house and on your gates and you and I shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We welcome you, Abba, Father. We welcome you, Father God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yeshua, our Lord and King. And Master, we honor you. Thank you that you dwell with us. With us. We lift up all the congregations today around New Zealand and those that are preparing, even in Israel or the rest of the world. Bless them as they honor you. Bless them as they lift up your name and prepare themselves for, for the week, for their neighbors, for the workplace, for whoever they meet, their families. Bless each one of them. Thank you. Thank you.
ended. We'll start our readings of the word. Going from Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Adonai. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. Yet my name, Adonai, did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them a land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, where they journeyed. Furthermore, I have heard the groanings of Ben Israel from the Egyptians, um, the Egyptians are keeping in bondage, so I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to Beni Israel, I am Adonai, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you to myself as a people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and give it to you as an inheritance. I am Adonai. Moses spoke this way to Beni Israel, but they did not listen to him because of their broken spirit and cruel bondage. So Adonai told Moses, Go, speak to Pharaoh king of Egypt, so that he will let Beni Israel go out of his, of his land. <clears throat> but Moses said to Adonai, Ben Israel have not listened to me, so how would Pharaoh listen to me? I, who have uncircumcised lips, then Adonai spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge for Ben Israel and Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring Ben Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanoch, Pulu, Hezron, and Kami. These are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon are Jamuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shul, the sons of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon were Libni, Shemai, according to their families. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived 133 years. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. These are the families of the Levites, according to their generations. Amram married Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived 137 years. The sons of Ishar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, el Zafan, and Shitri. Aaron married Elisheba, Elisheba, daughter of Amid Adav, sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eliisa and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, were Asiya, Elkanah, and Abisaf. These are the families of the Koharites. Eliisa, Aaron's son, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Pinias. These are the heads of the ancestral houses of the Levites, according to their families. These are the same Aaron and Moses, to whom Adonai said, Bring Beni Israel out from the land of Egypt, according to their divisions. These are the ones that spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring Beni Israel out of Egypt. These are that same Moses and Aaron. So it happened on the day when Adonai spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that Adonai said to Moses, I am Adonai. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything that I tell you. But Moses said to Adonai, I am of uncircumcised lips, so how would Pharaoh listen to me?
Oh, glad I didn't get that last reading. So Adonai said to Moses, See, I have set you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother will be your prophet. You are to speak all that I command, and Aaron your brother is to speak to Pharaoh, so that he will let B'nai Yisrael go out of the land, out of his land. Yet I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not listen to you. So I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my armies, my people, B'nai Yisrael, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians will know that I am Adonai when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out B'nai Yisrael from among them. So Moses and Aaron did as Adonai commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Adonai told Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Prove yourselves with a miracle, then you are to say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, so that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and did as Adonai had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called for the for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they too, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each man threw down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, so he did not listen to them, just as Adonai had said. Then Adonai said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out, of the, out to the water <coughs> and stand ready to meet him by the bank of the Nile. Take the staff that was transformed into a serpent in your hand. You are to say to him, Adonai, Adonai God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, so that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, you have not listened. This is what Adonai says. By this you will know that I am Adonai. Behold, I will strike the waters that are in the river with the staff that is in my hand, and they will be turned to blood. The fish that are in the river will die. The river will become foul and the Egyptians will hate to drink water from the Nile. Adonai said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, over their pools, and over all their ponds, so that they become blood. There will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in wooden and stone containers. So Moses and Aaron did as Adonai commanded. He lifted up the staff and struck the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and all the waters of the Nile turned to blood. When the fish that were in the river died, the river became so foul that the Egyptians could not drink water from the river. The blood was throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, just as Adonai had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not even take it to heart. So all the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink of the water from the Nile. Seven days were fulfilled after Adonai had struck the Nile. Then Adonai said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what Adonai says, Let my people go so that they may serve me. If you refuse to let them go, see, I will strike all your territory with frogs. The river will swarm with frogs. They will go up and enter your house, into your bedroom, upon your bed, into the houses of your servants, upon your people, 
into your ovens and in your kneading bowls. The frogs will climb up on you, your people and all your servants. Then Adonai told Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand, and with your staff over the rivers, canals, and pools, and cause frogs to come up over the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magician did the same with their secret arts, and brought up frogs over the land of Egypt. <coughs> then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to Adonai that he would take the frogs away from me and from my people. Then I will let the people go so that they may sacrifice to Adonai. Moses answered Pharaoh, Boast about me after I pray for you. When am I to pray for you, your servants and your people, that the frogs will be cut off from you and your houses and remain only in the Nile? Tomorrow, he said. So he said, let it happen according to your words, so that you may know that there is none like Adonai, our God. The frogs will depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, Moses cried out to Adonai concerning the frogs which he had brought upon Pharaoh. So Adonai acted according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out in the houses and the courts and the fields. They piled them together in large heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, just as Adonai had said. So Adonai said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, and it will become gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. So they did. When Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the earth, there were gnats on men and animals. All the dust of the earth became gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. When the magicians attempted the same with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, they could not. There were gnats on men and animals. So the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them, just as Adonai had said. Then Adonai said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. As he comes to the water, say to him, This is what Adonai says, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you do not let my people go, I will send the swarm of flies on you and on your servants, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of the swarm of flies, including the ground that they stand on. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are dwelling, except no swarm of flies will be there, so that you may know that I, Adonai, am in the midst of the earth. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. By tomorrow, the sign will happen. Adonai did just so. A massive swarm of flies went into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. All the land of Egypt was ruined because of the swarm of flies. So Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. But Moses said, That would not be right, for the offerings we intend to sacrifice to Adonai our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what is an, what is an abomination to the Egyptians, wouldn't they stone us? We must walk a three-day journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to Adonai our God, just as he tells us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go, so that you may sacrifice to Adonai your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Pray for me. So Moses said, See, I am leaving you, and I will pray to Adonai that the swarm of flies will depart from Pharaoh, his servants, and from his people tomorrow. However, let Pharaoh no longer deal deceitfully by not letting the people go sacrifice to Adonai. Then Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to Adonai. Adonai acted according to the word of Moses and removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Nothing remained. 
But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Then Adonai said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, This is what Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go, and hold them still, behold, the hand of Adonai will fall upon your livestock that are in the field, on the horses, donkeys, camels, herds and flocks. There will be a crushing plague. But Adonai will make a distinction between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and nothing will die that belongs to Benai Israel. Also Adonai set a specific time, saying, Tomorrow Adonai will do this thing in the land. Then the next day Adonai did the deed. All the cattle of Egypt died, yet all the cattle of Benai Israel, not one died. When Pharaoh inquired, there was not much... There was not so much as one of the cattle of Benai Israel dead, but the heart of the pharaohs was stubborn, and he did not let the people go. Then Adonai said to Moses and Aaron, Take a handful of soot, soot from the furnace and have Moses throw it heavenward in the sight of Pharaoh. It will come fine dust over the land of Egypt and will become boils erupting with sores on both men and animals throughout all the land. So they took the soot from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. When Moses threw it heavenward, it became boils erupting out with sores on both men and animals. Moreover, the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, because they were on the magicians as, of, as on all the Egyptians. But Adonai hardened their heart, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, so he did not listen to them, just as Adonai said to Moses. Then Adonai said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go so they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues to your heart and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Surely by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you with, and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. However, I let you stand for this reason to show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed throughout all the earth. Yet still you exalt yourself over my people by not letting them go. Behold, tomorrow at this time about this time, I will cause it to rain a very severe hailstorm, <coughs> the likes of which has not occurred in Egypt since the day it was founded until now. Send word, shelter your cattle and all that have. Send word, shelter your cattle and all that you have in the field, for every person and animal found in the field and not brought home when it the hail comes down on them, they will die. Whoever feared the word of the Lord of Adonai among the servants of Pharaoh had his own servants and cattle flee into the houses. But whoever disregarded the word of Adonai left his servants and cattle in the field. Then Adonai said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, and let there be hail in all the land of Egypt, on people, animals, and every plant of the field throughout all the land. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and Adonai sent thunder and hail. Fire came down on the earth as Adonai rained hail on the land of Egypt. The hail fell very severely, with fire flashing from amidst the hail, the likes of which had not occurred in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the fields, both men and animals, all throughout the land of Egypt. It also struck every plant of the field and broke down every tree. Only in the land of Goshen, where B'nai Israel were, 
there was no hail. So Pharaoh sent, called for Moses and Aaron, and said to them, I have sinned this time. Adonai is righteous, while I and my people are wicked. Pray to Adonai, there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to Adonai. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail. So you may know that the earth is Adonai's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear Adonai Elohim. The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bloom. But the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed because they ripen later. Moses went out of the city, away from Pharaoh, and stretched out his hand to Adonai. Then the thunder and hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured down on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he increased his sin and hardened his heart, both he and his servants. So Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let B'nai Israel go, just as Adonai had said by Moses' hand. Wow, the stubbornness of man's heart. We can be a bit like that sometimes, can't we? <laughs> no. Just me. <laughs>
This is a Hathor reading, and it begins in Ezekiel 28 and verse 25. Never again will you be a, a, a bit, um, bring, sorry, I'll start again. Never again will there be a buyer practicing in the house of the Israel or a purchasing from them, any around them, who will, be, who will scorn them. They will know that I am the Lord Adonai. Thus says Adonai Elohim, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the people among where they are scattered and show my holiness through them in the eyes of, of the um, nations, then they will live in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live there safely there, and then they will build houses and plant vineyards. They will live there securely when I have executed judgment on all those around about them that treated them with contempt. So they will know that I am Adonai, their God. This is a prophecy against Egypt. On the twelfth day of the tenth month of the tenth year, the word of Adonai came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith Adonai Elohim, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great crocodile lying in his rivers, who says, My Nile is my own. I made it for myself. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your stream stick to your scales. I will haul you up from within your rivers and all the fish of your streams will stick to your scales. I will leave you in the desert, you, will, you and all the fish of your streams. You will fall on the open field. You will not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food for the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt will know that I am Adonai, because they were a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took the hold of you by the hand, you snapped and tore all their shoulders. Then they would, when they leaned on you, you broke and wrenched up all their lip hips. Therefore, thus said Adonai Elohim, Behold, I will bring a sword against you, and I will cut off from you man and beast. The land of Egypt will become a desolate and waste, when they shall know that I am Adonai. Because he said, The Nile is mine, I made it. Therefore, behold, I am against you and against your rivers. I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation from Migdol to Cyrene, as far as the border of Ethiopia. No human foot will pass through it, and no foot of beast will pass through it. It will be uninhabited for 40 years. I will make the land of Egypt a desolation among the desolated, devastated countries. Her cities will be a desolation 40 years among ruined cities. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries. For 
thus says Adonai Elohim, At the end of forty years I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples where they were scattered. I will restore the fortunes of Egypt. I will cause them to return to the land of Pathros, the land of their origin. But they will be a lowly kingdom there. It will be the lowliest of the kingdoms. It will no longer exalt itself above the nations. I will diminish them so that they no longer rule over the nations. It will no longer be as security for the house of Israel, bringing to mind the iniquity of their turning after them. So they will know that I am Adonai. On the first day of the first month of the 27th year, the word of Adonai came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head became bald and every shoulder chafed, but he and his army had no profit from Tyre for the labor that he had expended against it. Therefore thus says Adonai Elohim, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He will carry off her abundance, take her spoil, and take her prey. It will be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt as his wages for which he served, because they worked for me. It is a declaration of Adonai. In that day I will cause a horn to shoot up from the house of Israel. I will open up your mouth among them. They will know that I am Adonai. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Egypt, which protected Israel for many, many, many centuries, actually. And it says it will no longer. It's interesting things that are beginning to happen, isn't it? There's always a lot of peace between Israel and Egypt. Anyway, we have a wonderful time right now. Vivian is going to bless us. The time of our Lord's Supper. Hello, lovely to see you. Old faces and new. It looks like I have a lot of paper, but I just printed it large print so I could actually see it. It's not my memoirs. It's okay. Hmm. So we'll see how it goes with plan A. People like to remember happy times and significant events. Memories are precious, they keep us connected to people and places and events that have shaped us and influenced our lives. We may wish we could forget some things, but even life's unpleasantries can offer lasting lessons learned through adversity. At the Last Supper, Yeshua shared a meal with his disciples and led them in the ancient observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Passover. Yeshua, the master teacher, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples gathered in that upper room. Yeshua shared this meal for their benefit and for ours. As Yeshua raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, he added new significance to this ancient ritual. Luke 22 records that Yeshua told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Yeshua took an old symbol and filled it with new meaning. The meaning of Yeshua's words and actions are rooted in his command to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. And whatever we call this observance, one thing is clear. It is a time to remember what he did for us. The Feast of Passover is the historical background for the establishment of the Lord's Supper. Exodus 12 presents the final chapter in God's miraculous rescue of Israel from slavery in Egypt. The plague of judgment of the firstborn 
for the angel of death to pass over a household, a family had to put blood from a sacrificed lamb on the doorframe of their house and eat the Passover meal as the Lord had prescribed. This lamb and the meal of unleavened bread became the abiding symbol of Israel's deliverance from bondage. As Yeshua's disciples watched Yeshua and listened to his words that Passover, they would have understood the historical significance of his actions. What they did not fully understand until after the crucifixion and resurrection, however, was the transformation of what had been a Jewish feast of remembrance into a new symbol for remembering Yeshua's atoning sacrifice. The God who acted in history to deliver his people, Israel, has also acted in history to deliver us. The elements used in the supper are, of course, not the real blood and body of Yeshua, but they are powerful symbols that cause us to remember what Yeshua really did suffer, and that he did really suffer and die in a real historical time and place. He was born of a woman. He was a man. Crucifixion was no ordinary punishment. The pain was unbearable. In Isaiah 53, the prophet portrays the suffering of Yeshua prophetically. Yeshua was not simply wounded, but he was crushed. He was torn and disfigured, and his blood loss and suffering was such that he stumbled on the weight of that cross. In Luke 22, Luke referred to Yeshua's ordeal as agony, the Greek agonia. It is because of this agony over things to come that we learn during this prayer at the Mount of Olives. His sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And that is thromboi hematos in the Greek, or hematotidros. It can occur under extreme times of stress and anguish and is known to occur, albeit really, by the medical fraternity to this day. So maybe that is why it appears that the physician, Dr. Luke, is the only disciple to mention it. We should remember the supper's redemptive sacrifice too. When John the Baptist saw Yeshua approaching, he cried out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John clearly established the reason for Yeshua's coming as a fulfillment of what the Passover Lamb had already foreshadowed. In Exodus 12, the Lamb was sacrificed for the deliverance of one family. At the cross, a lamb of God sacrificed to deliver the whole world from the power and penalty of sin. The Passover lamb served as the substitute for the firstborn of Israel, but Yeshua was our substitute at Calvary. Without the death of the lamb and the spreading of its blood, the children of Israel would have suffered the judgment of God. Without the shedding of the blood of Yeshua and his substitutionary death, we would have no hope of salvation. Yeshua said himself that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We should remember too the supper's personal sacrifice in Luke 22 records Yeshua's words, This is my body given to you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Yeshua personalized his statements by using the pronoun you. Yeshua told his disciples that he was going to suffer for them. He was going to die for them. True, Yeshua would die for everyone, but the sin of the world, for the sin of the world. But his disciples heard Yeshua say, I am doing this for you. Observing the Lord's Supper carries personal significance because Yeshua calls us to remember that he gave his body for you. It also carries personal responsibility for us to participate with reverence and humility. Paul said that our observance of the Lord's Supper is to be done to help us remember Christ. And remember, and maybe we are never more the church, the bride of Christ, than when we gather to worship by remembering him. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was Anzac and I went to a service, I went to an early morning service. 
it was very cold and dark and like five in the morning and there was about two and a half thousand people remembering those brave souls who went and fought and died so that we could have a free land to live in. And I wondered how many would turn up to remember the death of one man who did so much to basically give us a get out of jail free card if we would just accept it. And so how do we remember? Hello, there was Easter. What did we do then? We have little Easter bunnies and chocolate eggs and the jazz festival. The church got it so wrong. It's a pagan, it's a pagan remembrance. It has nothing to do with the man who sacrificed all for us. Interestingly, the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread each have a specific theme. The feast of Passover has the theme of deliverance from the judgment that came upon the Egyptians. The feast of unleavened bread has the theme of deliverance out of Egypt. These two feasts and their themes and their pictures of the cross harmonize perfectly with the meanings of the two elements of the Lord's Supper. The cup, the blood, represents deliverance from the judgment of sin. And the bread, unleavened, his body without sin, represents deliverance out of sin. So my friends, Yeshua said that he would not drink the fruit of the vine again until he came into the fullness of the kingdom. Whenever we participate, we are reminded of Yeshua's promise. And hey, he's coming back to get us. And that is so cool. And we can know and, and, and rest on that. There will be a great messianic banquet, a wedding supper of celebration. The bread and the wine are miniature rehearsals of what will be the greatest victory celebration in all history. So today, let us celebrate with gratitude. And let us never forget. Bless you as you come forward with a grateful heart to partake the bread and the wine. Baruch Ata Arunai Alachinu Melechel Ashur Gershano, a bit a bit of of Bedno Alano et Yeshua Mishakenu Vitzadano Eliot O Alam. Blessed are you, Arunai our God, King of the Universe who has sanctified us with his word, and has given us Yeshua, a Messiah, and commanded us to be the lights to the world. Blessed to you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And with the bread, Baruchata Ronai Lakani Malachalom Hamotse Lechim Menharetz. Blessed are you, Aronai our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. We also thank you, Yeshua, for your body, which has made us whole, brought healing. We ask your healing as we eat it to both our spiritual being and to our physical bodies. Thank you, Yeshua. Come and eat and drink. This is wine on the side and this is grape juice on the side. In this time of remembrance, it's also wonderful to be able to be able to pray for one another. If anyone needs prayer or for anything, ask the person or people around you to pray for you right now. Strength for healing, for anything. 
Because the spirit, the ruach, is within the person beside you. Okay? So we'll do that. We have anointing oil here if you would like it. And um, it's also um, a good time. We will, I'll just pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But also, I'd just like uh, Dorothy to just come up and we'll just pray for her because uh, she's got the privilege of going to Israel. And this, woohoo, how exciting is that? How exciting. So just reach your hand towards her. And let's just lift her up. Father, oh, the privilege of being able to travel and visit your land again. To walk through the streets of Jerusalem. Father God, her heart is towards the people there. And Father, we just lift her hands. And, for, and, and Father, the, the, as she ministers to those that are there, strengthen her in body. Yes. Father, she'll have a wonderful, refreshing time, but also being able to bring your encouragement yes. to your people there. Yes. Father, both, both the Jewish people and the, the Arab people, Father. But Father, the Lord, that they will be working together, walking in your ways, especially the, the, the believers, Father. Bless them as they work together and walk together in your ways. Lord, as one man, Father, we just ask that you'll just really bless her. And Father God, even prophetically, Father, just bring words of life and strength and hope to those and sometimes a difficult situation. In fact, not sometimes, in a difficult situation. The Father bless her. The Father, she, her travels will be sweet. And she brings it back to us and with the great news of things that are happening. Father, we just thank you. Thank you. And Father, we just ask afresh for, for all the congregations that will meet in, in Israel. Uh, on Shabbat, a few hours' time, that, Father, you'll bring protection, yes. that you'll bring a strength, yes. that you'll bring the hope and, and the joys. Father, we know that persecution does come. Yes. Father, God, give them strength through it and in it. And they continue to have love for one another. Yes. And, Father, that uh, you, you'll bring, we know that the peace that you is going to be lasting peace will only come when you return. We look forward to that. But in the meantime, give them the peace in their hearts. Their peace with them as they work together, working together in difficult environments and situations. Praying, Father, for the, for the, uh, the, 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 the government of the state of Israel. But Father God, working in, 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 as part of your purposes in preparation for your return. But Father, we just ask that they will open their, their, their eyes. Their eyes will be opened. Father, as they, as they read your word, yes. Father, as they talk about it, yes. as they yes. see the things that are happening, yes. Father, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the, the blinds will be removed from their eyes yes. and their ears will be opened. Yes. Yes. Father, that through even the Prime Minister and his family, yes. Father, as they read your word and, and discuss things yes. together, yes. that they will be the instigators, yes. that will listen to the Messianic Rabbis, yes, the Father, that they have confidence to be able to come forward, not be for fear of persecution. Yes, Father, we just thank you for them. Bless them today. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I'll be back on the 11th, I think it's 10th of February, so it's not Exciting. Right. <laughs> and I'm going into the Knesset. I'm going to all kinds of interesting places, so I've uh, got an appointment to go to the Knesset to meet with um, Yehuda Glick, who's a member of the Knesset, yes. and uh, I've got, um, I'll be going to the Arab Church, going to Messianic Congregation, to Ethiopian Congregation, I'll be going down to Chebedachin, down on um, Tabi, down on the, um, in Jaffa, where the uh, children ministry that I worked with is um, wow. having heart surgery done, they've given me a couple of days down there go down to Besheba. So it's, I, I was going to go to a conference, but 
they really didn't any time. And the, and the Glick family have got an apartment in Jerusalem, and they said, I can use it. Oh. So that is absolutely unbelievable because accommodation in Israel is almost is very expensive, and particularly in Jerusalem. And uh, they wrote a note and they said, well, she's got a good heart. Please be kind to her. This is a person that's going to open the door and I only wish she was Jewish. <laughs> I think that is a great compliment. Wonderful. Mm. Hallelujah. Yes. Go with the favour of the Lord. Do. Okay, so just have a time for a rest and then we'll carry on with the Brit Havashah. It's a new covenant readings. So, none of this. And if, anyway, if you don't know anyone, please make yourself known to them. Okay? And uh, that's what family does and make your own feel at home. Romans 9 14 what shall we say then there is no injustice with God is there may it never be for Mo for to Moses he says I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion so then it does not depend on the one who wills or the one who strives but on God who shows mercy ain't that the truth for the scripture says to for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, so that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's it. Yes. Since we are co-laboring, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, at a favourable time I listened to you, and a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the favourable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no cause for offence in anything, so that our ministry may not be blamed. But as God's servants, we are commending ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in afflictions, and hardships, and distresses, and beatings, and imprisonments, and riots, and troubles, and sleeplessness, and hunger, and purity, and knowledge, and patience, and kindness, and the Ruach HaKodesh, and genuine love, and truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Through honour and dishonour, through evil report and good report, we are regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, yet behold we live, as disciplined, as not put to death, as grieving, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet enriching many, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken openly to you, O Corinthians, our heart is open wide. You are not restricted by us, yet you are restricted in your own feelings. Now in return, I speak as to my children, open wide to us also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony does Messiah have with Bel Belial? Or what part does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement does God's temple have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says Adonai. Touch no unclean thing, then I will take you in. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Adonai. Therefore, since we have these promises, loved ones, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of body and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God.
the Song of Moses to the Lamb. Then I saw another great and wonderful sign in heaven, seven angels who have seven plagues, the last ones, for with them God's wrath is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had overcome the beast and its image and the number of his name standing by the sea of glass, holding the harps of God. And they are singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and wonderful are your deeds, Adonai Elohit Savot. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who shall not fear and glorify your name, O Lord, for you alone are holy. All the nations shall come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tent of the witness of heaven was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, dressed in pure bright linen, and wearing wide gold sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one was able to enter the table, the temple until the seven angels, seven plagues were finished. This is Revelation 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. <clears throat> and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as blood of the dead men and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of the waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged this. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth, fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea, upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are all spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a, as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel sounded out his vial into the air, 
And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, and the plague of thereof was exceeding great. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that reminds me of, um, of, the, of the scripture, we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers in high places. It's important that we understand that. And as part of, we've been given the authority and the power as disciples. That's what it says. We've been given the power and authority. Because we walk in Him. Not that it's a matter of working out how to utilize it and how to use that power, isn't it? Using it wisely so that the name of God will be lifted up and glorified. <clears throat> well, last week's parasha, Shemot, which means names. God appeared to Moshe at the foot of Mount Sinai in the burning bush. And he instructed him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And bondage that they'd lived in for 200 plus years. And we look at the thing of, you know, they talk about the Israelites being in Egypt for 430 years. But that makes up the component from the, the, the time when they first arrived right through, and, and but they're actually only in, in Egypt itself for about 417 years, uh, 217 years. But it's a hang of a long time. We talked about it right near the beginning, about Abraham, the prophecy he had. If you had received a prophecy like that, would you have any children? Because <laughs> the interesting thing, it said that they would, his children, and the the generations after him would go to Egypt and be in bondage for 400 years. I mean, knowing that, would you have gone ahead? <laughs> man, I'm not too sure. It's one of those sort of things. It's interesting, isn't it? But he was a man of faith because it says after, it says, you are the, of the promise, the seed of the promise. And that promise goes through not just the Jewish people, but to all people. Isn't that exciting? Man, wow. We were in God's eyes right from the beginning. And the Hebrews had been crying out to God for release from their suffering. And have, you been, have you been crying out to God for release? Or to him to act in your circumstances? And I just have two words. Press on. Press on. Not press on in a hard, grumbly way, but press on excited, knowing that whatever comes, you will have the authority and ability to work through it. Irrespective of the, what's thrown against you and what circumstance, because you sure Ruach HaKadosh within you. And if we do not have some form of pressure or persecution in our uh, spiritual lives, then something is not quite right. I know you may not like to hear that. 
But as it is written, it says in Timothy 3, verse 12, Yes, and all who decide to live godly in Messiah Yeshua will suffer persecution. Whew. But that's how Abraham saw it. Abraham saw it. He knew what was going to happen. But that was part of the package. Just like the people in, in, the, in the wilderness. The occurrence of being in the wilderness for 40 years, that is part of the refining life. And it's how we perceive it and how we deal with it is how it's going to affect us and those around us. Moshe perceived himself to be slow of speech. So God appointed his brother Aaron to be the spokesperson. And although we too might feel rather ill-equipped at times, inadequate or inferior like Moshe, we must remember that God, who has called us by our name, and he's called us by name, is fully aware of your and my weaknesses and strengths and failures large and small. He sees our potential and he will um, help us achieve well beyond our limitations. So don't limit what God has placed within you. Don't look down on what God has already provided and placed within you. Okay? Grab hold of it. Say, thank God. Giving us everything we need to cooperate with his plan. Because it is his plan in our lives. And that takes a bit of a mental shift. When the brothers went uh, before Pharaoh, he refused to let the Israelites go. Instead, he made the situation. Instead of making their situation better, the Israelites' enslavement became more extensive and it became worse, more oppressive. Why would you go and pray to God then? It was going to make it worse. But some, that's some part of it. We don't know God's ways. It's part of the equation. It's the end that is the matter. We're running a good race. It's well done. Good and faithful servant. And when the brothers... Um, sorry, and of course, the children of Israel complained to Moshe, so he brought their suffering before God, who reassured him that things would turn around. And God told him that he would not only save the Israelites with a mighty deliverance, but Pharaoh would drive them out of Egypt. It was essential for God that all would fully know him, and hence... He gave the name, Aye, Asher, Aye, which means I am, will be what I am, and will be forever. Likewise, he wants the world today to acknowledge that the one true God is Adonai Chad. It's a complex unity. Abba Father, Yeshua, Son, and the Ruach Hagodash. For this week, the parasha Vaya means I appeared. And it begins with God introducing himself and saying, I am Adonai, who has also been referred to as El Shaddai, which means God the all-sufficient and bountiful one. So if you're in need for things, call to him by name. Call to him. And he says, I will answer you. The Lord told Pharaoh that he was going to strike Egypt so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. And in order to show your power, you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth, now, what does it mean to proclaim God's name? To proclaim God's name, it means to reveal God's character, proclaim his person, his, his power, and his glory. The revelation of God's name, actually, 
It's a theme, and it actually flows right through the story of the ten plagues and exodus from Egypt. And the Lord told Pharaoh what he said, um, that he had raised him up and allowed him to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. And the story begins, began with God revealing his name to Moshe at the burning bush. And when Moshe first delivered his message to Pharaoh, the Pharaoh protested that he had never heard of the name of the Lord. At the beginning of the parasha, the Lord explains to Moshe that he had not revealed his name to the forefathers as he was about to do to Israel in Egypt. It's interesting, isn't it? That he hadn't fully explained himself to be prior to that. In the rest of the story, God smites Egypt and rescues Israel in order to make his name known to the world. He used the opportunity to show the world that he is, and who he is, and to establish his reputation. Because people have forgotten who he was. And the signs and the wonders that he brought against Egypt glorified his name and accurately reveals who he was, his saving power, his mighty arm. And Messiah Yeshua had exactly the same objective. As he reclined at his, the Seder table amongst the disciples, he prayed, I've glorified you on earth, I've manifested your name. And he said to Peter, and who do you say? I am. Right? He is about our name. And he asks you the same sometimes, is who are you? Who are you? He hasn't made you just as a number, as a person. He's made you to reveal his glory. Okay? He's made you to reveal his glory to those around you. And some of the people that you are influenced, are influenced to and meet can only be the, uh, the, the authority or the, the influence that you can be of God to them. Otherwise, they may never know. They may never see it. So be a reasonable picture for them to see. Be nice. That's a good start. Be nice. We often say that to our wonderful old folk at home, at the rest home. We speak to them and say, you want to have friends? You want to have people come and visit you? You want your relatives to come to visit you? Be nice. Be nice to each other. That's a good start. Yeah. For three years, he displayed God's glory through his miraculous works. That was Yeshua. Through his signs and his teachings. And he, as he reclined that night at the Seder table on the eve of Passover, he was about to reveal fully God's name through the ultimate sign, his resurrection from the dead. God promises Moshe, uh, Moshe that, that he will accomplish four redemptive acts. He would bring out the Israelites from their suffering in Egypt, rescue them from slavery, redeem them through, uh, from their oppression with his outstretched arm, and take them to his own nation. He says, and I appeared, the area to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov as El Shaddai, but my, by my name, Yahweh, I will not make myself known to them. And these four promises are called the four expressions of redemption. They're traditionally commemorated during the Passover Seder, with the ritual meal, with four cups of wine, and we covered those things before. But see, for each of these acts of deliverance, um, God used the following Hebrew words. Hutsetse, 
which means I will bring out. Hitzalakti, which means I will rescue. Ga'elakti, which means I will redeem. And Lakriti, which means I will take. God also makes a fifth expression of redemption. He promises that he will bring Hevieti, his people back, back into their own land. And that's the fifth one. And 2,000 years ago, when the Jewish people lived in the promised land, this fifth expression may have been commemorated with the fifth cup of the wine during the Seder. And that's often the cup which is put aside. We deal also with the um, remembrance of Elisha coming back. Although God has been rescuing the Jewish people from their exile and bringing them back to the land, the fifth cup is considered to represent the completion of redemption through Messiah. And this fifth cup at the Passover Seder, therefore, is called the cup of Elijah, which is left untouched for the prophet Elijah, who is expected to return to the earth to herald the coming of the Messiah and his messianic reign. When God speaks a word, it will be done as he said. And despite how circumstances appear in the natural, we often can't see how things are going to happen. We think we can. But that's putting, trying to put God in a box. He doesn't mind us having a good debate and a good uh, uh, think, um, laugh about it and uh, study it. And everyone's got their own viewpoints and different opinions. At the end of the day, the most important thing is to encourage one another to study the scriptures and uh, not get too hit up about some of the things because we don't, we don't quite know how everything is going to quite turn out. But it says to establish for yourself in your, in, in your own eyes. We live in a fallen world. Many of us suffer from spiritual short-sightedness. Short caused by the focusing on our own sufferings and things that affect us. And that's not unnatural, but he does want us to look up. Okay? That's why he wants us to look up. That's why it's important to encourage yourself. And Shul said, you know, speak to yourself in psalms and songs and spiritual songs. Use the gifts that have been given to you. Encourage yourself in the faith, most holy faith. Encourage one another. Look up. It doesn't belittle the difficulties that we go through. Be comforting, be strengthening to one another. You know? Don't say just get over it. I mean, I often say that. <laughs> you know? Get on with it, fast it. That's easy to say. But when you're going through it, your arm is to be around them, encouraging, lifting up. Empathy, praying, loving. The Israelites, well, they were no different. They were so downtrodden and grieved in the spirit that they simply could not believe that Moshe, as the Lord, would do for them. They couldn't even listen to the words of hope because of this, their discouragement and the harsh labour. Interesting enough, I was watching a video just on, on, on YouTube or something about um, someone had done an interview of many people in Israel on, 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 on Jesus, on Yeshua, and on, on who, who do you think he was? And, and, and m m many of them it came through, they, it was kind of, they got tainted by the things that had occurred, by people who said that they loved Yeshua, but almost hated those people. 
You know? And so over that period of time, it's, so love them, care for the Jewish people. Because it takes a lot to shift. It's, it's, it's in the scriptures. Why can't they see it? Why can't they see it? And it's because it's the mindset, the thing that's been downtrodden for so many years, so long. It's become part of the psyche. That they just can't see it. That's part of the reason why they're so blind. Can't see it. We see from, uh, from, from hindsight, from, from a different perspective. But for many who've been through the Holocaust, been through centuries of hatred and everything else, that many of them don't even want to be part of God. They don't even want to be part of his people. You know, because they think, well, hang about. I'm only going to get it in the neck again. Choose someone else. Choose someone another people. So let's be gracious. Be there for them. This tendency to human nature will remind us that we, it, to be patient and merciful as we minister to people. Even today, many of these bondage, those in bondage, is so cruel and whose spirit is so broken that they cannot hear those who preach the good news of Yeshua. As God has, had commanded them, Moshe and his brother Aaron returned to Pharaoh over and over again, demanding that he let God's people go so that they may serve him in the wilderness. And this whole account of God's redemption of Israel from Egypt has a spiritual parallel in our salvation from the kingdom of darkness ruled by Hashatan, literally the adversary, and the kingdom of light ruled by the Lord. We are delivered through faith in Yeshua, the Passover lamb, not simply to, to walk away and do our own thing, as it was for the Israelites. The purpose of our freedom is to serve the living God. For we are rescued, for he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the wonderful kingdom of his son, whom he loves, to whom we have redemption, through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. That's in Colossians 1, 13 to 14. Now the River Nile, it runs through Cairo. And this important river was the location of the first ten plagues. And the first one was the blood. And God gave Moshe and Aaron a special sign to show Pharaoh. In the Hebrew, the, the, the sign is called a mafet, which means a marvel or a wonder. And Aaron was to throw the stick down before Pharaoh, and it would be transformed. And in most English translations, we see that the stick turned into a serpent. But there was another part of the reading, which actually when you flip through into uh, Revelations, it's quite interesting. What does it talk about? It talks about uh, the Australian. Yeah, the Australian crocodile. Not the Australians. <laughs> but yeah, the crocodile. And that's what it was. See, in the Hebrew, the word is tanin, which means a crocodile. So you can kind of get your hair out. A lot of people are thinking, oh, the snake, yeah, you suck up the other ones. Yeah, and they do. But a crocodile, now that's more ferocious, isn't it? The crocodile, the snap, snap. Man alive. Wow, seeing a crocodile. Oh, that changes your perspective on things. And... Um, so, yeah. The Pharaoh, as God foreknew, still refused to let the people go, even though that big crocodile swallowed up all the other things that were thrown down. God sent a judgment on Egypt Again, in the form, as a result, in the form of ten plagues. Increasingly, the things kind of got worse and worse. 
These plagues are remembered each year at the Passover Seder during the second cup of the wine. And it's interesting, each of those plagues has a God with it. And, those, and the things there are actually all quite symbolic, all the various gods of Egypt. And that's why God was so important about the concept that um, it's to them, to the people of Egypt, they were good things. And sometimes the things we do in society, we think, oh, there are good things, but who do they bring in glory to? And that's why when we're talking and looking about, you know, it says they should have no, have, have no other God before, have no idols. Some of the things that you need to ask yourself, some, are some of the things I do, and the, some of the things I give, you know, give credence to or honor to, are they an idol to me? You know, they may seem good, but I encourage you, just ask God. It's your responsibility. Not my responsibility to tell you. It's your responsibility to find out for yourself. And, and, and let the Holy Spirit guide so that we walk with the light that we have. Each of us made holy in his image. One drop is removed from the cup as, as, as part of the, the custom and practice um, for each of the plagues, while the, while the leader often recites the list of the judgments in Hebrew. That's what they do, take it out, a little drop at a time. And the idea of being this custom is that a cup cannot be full while others are suffering. Anyway, first, the, the waters of the, the Nile we talked about before were turned into blood, which in Hebrew the word is dumb, making it undrinkable. And then they had the frogs swarm the land and then an infestation of lice, which tormented man and beast. And until the, the plague of the lice, the Kinem, the Egyptian magicians and, for, and uh, sorcerers, they were able to duplicate them with their, with their plague. But in this particular case, after that, they couldn't. They recognised, even so, they recognised that this was the finger of God. And, and it, sometimes it takes um, line upon line, precept upon precept. Sometimes it takes time. Even give grace to one another. Sometimes it takes time to get your head around it. You know, why are we doing this? You know? Um, especially some of us who have been walking in the Lord's way for, for many years. It, it's important more so that those who come to understand Yeshua and accept Yeshua, give them the grace. Tie, line upon line. Precept upon precept. And things will then slowly move away. God, our Pharaoh, had hardened his heart. It was interesting what it says, increased in sin. Increased in sin. Hardened his heart. It would not listen to the voice of reason. And this is one of the surest signs of pride, isn't it? A humble man will receive correction willingly, but a person with pride immediately becomes defensive and will not listen to others. Uh, this can bring about one's downfall. So it's important that we listen and not become defensive. It says, pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Note the contrast between Pharaoh and Moshe, who even today is considered to be the most humble of men to have walked on the earth. And that's what the scripture says. When Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, corrected him on his approach to settling disputes between the Israelites in, in the wilderness, Moshe listened and took heed. And it was his father-in-law. <laughs> and mine his father. So, he must have been humble. This week we uh, witnessed a true tug of war between Yahweh and man. And guess who won? 
every time Pharaoh attempted to uh, challenge Yahweh, he caused his people who blindly and apparently begrudgingly followed, and it is took the Egyptians, they blindly and apparently begrudgingly followed and obeyed their leader. And he managed, as sometimes do many leaders today, sadly, managed to deceive people into thinking they're perfect and have the answers to everything. I'm talking about the leaders. So everyone must, it's important that everyone walks humbly. And again, I stress the importance of each individual to study and to know the word of God for themselves. Okay? Don't look to man, look to God. Although Pharaoh promised to let the Jewish people go after the plague of the lice, he hardened his heart and he didn't renege on his promises. And as a result, God sent swarms of flies that covered the land, then a disease that killed all the cattle, and God made a distinction between Israel and Egypt. And while all the cattle of Egypt died, not even one of Israel's cattle fell to the disease. This actually underlines the importance and reliability of being in covenant relationship with the Almighty God. None of Egypt's best sorcerers and, and masters of the cult could save them from the hand of God. But when you are in God, he will protect you doesn't mean that everything's going to go all smoothly and all perfectly because that's not going to happen either. But our trust is in him. The parasha ends with the seventh plague of hail. God sent thunder fire and grievous hail that destroyed everything and anything in the field, including man and beast and all vegetation. It was only in Goshen, where the Israelites lived, that there was no hail. We know that the book of Revelation, that many of these plagues will again strike the inhabitants of the earth in the ends of times. And these events that happened in Egypt, they foreshadow what is to come possibly on even a global scale in the final days. There will come a time when heaven will again unleash plagues and signs revealing God's name, not merely upon Egypt, but over the, all the earth. And the prophecies of the, of the book of Revelation, they speak of plagues to come. And the vision that, um, that, that John describes, God describes seven of the plagues. It says, I saw another sign in heaven, and great and marvellous, even angels having the seven plagues. For, thee, for, uh, for in them is filled with the wrath of God. We covered all the different plagues in the readings. It says, witnesses will like Moses, will appear with power over the waters and turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they, their desire. It's Revelation 11, verse 6. And the spirits will afflict the humanity like locusts and frogs. Plagues of hail and blood will descend on the earth and pestilence and famine and woe. It will consume Babylon. As in Egypt, the, the plagues will conclude with the redemption of God's people and the publication of God's name. And that day, the Lord will be the one and his name will be one. Zechariah 14, 9. While the scripture promises that the natural cycle of winter and summer will not end, it does say that God will intervene in the earth's weather turning the wilderness green in Israel and blessing it with early and latter rains. 
may we be ever, ever mindful that we are living in the end times. And while we remain safe in the security of our holy covenant with God, let us patiently share the good news and diligently pray for mercy on those who stubbornly and continue to rebel against God. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That's Micah 7 verse 19. So the part of where we know that all the things are going to come, but we know that if we're in Yeshua, he will see us through it. And that's exciting. But it's not to be kept to ourselves. Our responsibility is to share it with those around us. To all those who don't know, don't, haven't heard. It's so important that we share that goodness, share his love, share what he's going to do. Help people to understand what's going to what come on. Help them, to, help, help them to recognize the signs of the times. That's our responsibility. Otherwise, life just becomes one, a cruising exercise, isn't it? Just from one day to the next, one week to the next, month to the next, year in, year out. No, the exciting thing is seeing people here. The goodness of God. And to change. And to change, to, to, to be like him. And that's what we need for each other. Not just each other, but for those in our families and around about. And I say, press on. Press through. Because that's the only way. That's the only way you will know and enjoy your walk by seeing others lead through to him, through you. So for this week, go for it. Enjoy the challenge. Have fun in it. And know that Yeshua, Jesus, is coming. Who you Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom.